Feel as you feel with that judgment. See, if you apply the alchemical transmutation process in the way that you observe everything and you go, oh, um, yeah, I might transmute that. Uh, no, I won't transmute that. Oh, that's right, I forgot for three days. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll just transmute a few things because I forgot for a few days. Uh, yeah, I'll transmute that and I won't transmute that. Oh, that feels good. I won't do it. That's not how it works. When you're refining your identity, when you're letting go of all of this false identity, you just, for a long period of time, it's just about running the process over everything you feel. Regardless of if it feels good or pleasurable or yucky or you just run the process over everything you feel. Because it's about refining your whole nature. And part of what you need to do is refine the bias, the preference that you have to experience pleasure rather than pain, rather than just embracing all of life. So you have to transmute everything you feel. Over a period of time, you actually refine the false identity to the point where you get back in touch with the, the essence of your true self. And with most of you, I still don't see you doing that regularly. Just, every, just a, getting, starting the process and just running it and then it's refining constantly. Whatever you're feeling is being refined. It's like, oh, whew, well, that's a yucky feeling, so whew, I'll, I'll, I'll transmute that. Oh, okay, now I'll stop the process until the next time I have a yucky feeling. You know? You've got to start it, run it all the time. The people that are having real success is because they just get to the point where they just start the process when they get up in the morning and they just transmute everything they feel. They don't think about it, they don't judge it, anything, they just transmute everything they feel. And eventually all you're left with is the authentic self. You can't transmute something that's authentic. Because the refining process of your nature will lead to authenticity. So if it is the true expression of who you really are, you can't transmute it. So you just run the process over everything, over everything. And it's, it's a really fast track process to end up as your authentic self. So you, if you occupy your mind with these sorts of things, your mind's very happy just to do what, you know, it's got something to do, something to keep it, keep it busy and pass the time. Yeah, it occupies it too. It gives it something to do. So it's like, you know, you leave the dog at home every day by itself. Of course, it's going to be naughty. It's bored. <laughs> if you're constantly holding an intention to be aware of what you are feeling, you are constantly grateful for the experience, whatever it is. You're constantly acknowledging whatever you are feeling and you are constantly observing yourself and if you find yourself judging anything you instantly catch yourself and release the judgment and you're constantly affirming and choosing that what's important to you in your life is unconditional love and gratitude and compassion and so forth the process will run all the time it just runs all the time Yeah, how do you fit it all in? Sacrificing boredom is a good start. Um, it's amazing when you really make the shift. You know, you can sort of spend all afternoon looking forward to being able to put your feet up for half an hour. It's amazing how much... Well, you know, sometimes you're just in the flow and you, you, you work for a couple of hours and you seem to get a day's worth done in two hours. 
But if you're just, ah, oh, you're just hanging for the day to end so that you can sit down with a cuppa and put your feet up for half an hour, that's what I mean, you've got to sacrifice boredom. Because if you're wanting to, if you're really prioritising those moments when you can just sit and do nothing, and you're really looking forward to it, you do the complete opposite and the time in between now and when you have the opportunity to be bored and just sit up, sit around and do nothing, you, you can't fit much into that time. So it seems like hours pass and you've got nothing done. So it really is a, a great trick in time mastery. You have to sacrifice boredom. You can't prioritise, oh, just... Oh, sitting around doing nothing and putting your feet up and doing nothing. That can't be something that you're constantly looking forward to because it, it makes the moments between doing nothing such that you can't fit much activity into them. You, so if you sacrifice boredom completely, you'll find that you can accomplish a lot more in a, in a particular given period of time. It's like it stretched, the time stretches out. So it, it might sound a little silly, but when you really get it, it you'd be amazed at the change and how much you can accomplish. You know, when you have a lot of uh, different priorities and people in your life that you've caused to be dependent on you for a period of time, of course that's important. Ultimately, there's no real easy formula for, for balancing a demanding husband, as in your words, uh, with um, the needs that you have to honour and sort of nurture yourself. The reality is, though, that you can't really meet the needs of a partner, whether they're demanding or otherwise, or a child with their, whatever needs they have, unless you really nurture yourself. So to a certain degree, you need to it's not about being selfish, but it is about understanding that if you prioritise your own spiritual needs and psychological well-being and your own health and so forth, that you have, uh, you're better able to give quality attention to all the other things in your life. So to me, those two things, if you, if you get those things that are straightened out, that'll eliminate a lot of the struggle in you. And struggle and <sighs> not sure where to put your energy when, that wastes a lot of time. So if you end that struggle within yourself and you also really look at um, sacrificing boredom completely from your life, you'll find that you'll be able to fit a lot more into each day and you won't be as tired and you won't have that inner struggle happening. So see how that, that works for you. It's about not engaging in addictive behaviour, which does really weird sometimes to your perception of time and your ability to manipulate time. Um, you know, one of the characteristics of an addiction is that, um, you know, sex is a wonderful form of communication. You're very lucky if you have a regular sexual, sexual partner. And while you're engaging in sex, you should be fully present and fully into it, but it shouldn't be preoccupying at you. It shouldn't be on your mind when you're not having sex. It's not like you mightn't go, oh, it might be nice to make time to have sex tonight. That's different. But if you, you know, if you drink regularly, drink alcohol regularly, and a lot of the time when you're at work or whatever, you're looking forward to the next time you can have a drink, you're an addict. If you really enjoy sex and a lot of the time when you're not having sex, you're just going about your day-to-day -day business, but you're looking forward to the next time you can have sex, you're an addict, you know? If you're going about your daily tasks and a certain amount of those things that you resent, you resent a certain amount of those things that you're doing and you're really looking forward to just getting home and putting your feet up, then you know, you're an addict to some degree and you're certainly not in present time. If you're not in present time, you can't stretch it out so you can fit more in. So it's about your attitude. It's about being fully present in each and every moment. It's about a whole lot of things. You know. 
deal with what is present rather than what is absent. It's a really good rule of thumb. Deal with what is present now rather than what is absent. You ever had the experience of you take two weeks off work and you're really looking forward to it and you, you knock off work and you've got two weeks and then you start getting in the car and you're, you're, ready, to, you're ready to go and you, you're going away and then it's like, oh, bugger, it's going to end. It's only two weeks and it's, oh, you know, I wish it was longer, I wish it was longer. And you, you're driving along and you go past a signpost and the next minute you're going back home, driving past the same signpost and it's like those two weeks are just a blur. You ever had that sort of experience? Time is very malleable. In the experience, your quality of experience of time is so much to do with your attitude, your willingness to be in the present. A lot of people confuse what it is to be in the present. You go away for those holidays for two weeks, whatever, wishing that this moment wouldn't end is not the same as being in the present moment. <laughs> Oh, I wish this moment would last forever. Well, that's the really good way to make it go like that. <laughs> you know? And the more you, you, the more you want the moment to end, the longer it seems to drag out. It's like you're watching the clock and it's two hours till, oh, two hours till you knock off work. And it's like, oh, God. And it seems like you're working for hours and you look up and, oh, it's five minutes later. Oh, my God. <laughs> Now everyone's had that experience. So time is, is very malleable. There's the, the machine which counts its own ticks called a clock. That's not time. Moments can be, ah, seem like they last forever, or moments can be fleeting. A whole series of moments can be fleeting. Now the potential for experience and activity is the same for each and every moment. But so much about what we create within that moment as far as our orientation of consciousness and our attitude sets up the actual experience of that and how fast it seems to pass or not. So you can, and the other thing is people have a lot of trouble with time management because they think that oh, I need more time, so I need to speed time up. But if you speed time up, you have less time. Because time passes more quickly. So the, the moment's still the same size, but if you speed time up, you actually have less time. If you want more time, you slow time down, not speed it up. That's a big mistake that people make and they start to be able to have the ability to, to manipulate time. So if you need more time, you slow time right down because you can't change the size of a moment. So if you want more time in the moment, you slow time down. Sorry? What? But it does contradict something you said in the CD once. You said if you want more time, you've got to speed it up. Like a river. If it flows faster, you get more water than the same Yes, it's a different analogy. Yes, one's, one's a mechanical analogy and the other one is a conscious perception thing. So I know that seems to be contradictive, but it's actually saying the same thing. So activity-wise, it, it, it actually works inversely. In order to increase the amount of activity which is possible, you slow it down to increase the amount of consciousness that's contained within it, you speed it up. 
and the two balance each other, which give you this, gives you the same vector analysis of that particular moment. Um, it's you know, have you ever had a car accident? You know, and it's like, oh my God, that the instant that the car accident happened seems like it's taken minutes. And there's this incredible attention to detail. So there's this weird thing which happens with consciousness and there's this weird thing which happens with activity and they seem to be counterintuitive to each other. So there's an, a speeding up and a slowing down at the same time. Yeah. And the net result is that you, you have... <sighs> There's a, there's a trade-off. When you play with time, you'll either have an, an increase in the amount of cognitive activity or physical activity. It's not kind of both. So depending on the way that you do it, you'll either end up with a moment which seems to, you know, look, if you're, if you're having one of those moments with, with a new lover and you're just looking into their eyes, what is it that you want more of in the moment? Is it more activity or more of that exchange, that magical exchange when you're connecting through the eyes the souls are connecting and you're getting to know each other, you know, on this whole other level. So it's not that you want actually to be able to fit more activity into the moment, is it? It's a whole other thing that you want to increase and extend. It seems like it's going on forever. Yeah, yeah. Which is different to wanting to get more things done in a moment, right? So that's where the apparent disparity comes from. The more you, if you notice, you have, when you buggerise around with time and you get like, you've just accomplished, oh, you accomplish like three days work and it seems like ten minutes. So it's like you've, you've done a lot more in less time. You know what I mean? So with the activity side of things, whereas the moment of looking in someone's eyes when you have that new connection and that magical kind of thing, it seems like the time has massively increased. You get the difference? Yeah. yeah. And I, and so you're getting more space for less time. Whereas if you want more consciousness, you get like m uh, more time with less space. So that's where the apparent disparity is, you know. Because um, on the CD, I'm talking about how you fit more spiritual growth into a particular moment, which is different to playing with time so that you can get more done in in a in a particular moment. It's it's a different. Thing. Do, do you understand what, I'm, what I mean? Yeah. So like when you're going into your Viola Flame meditation, you know, can make the, your 20 minute Viola Flame meditation seem like it's taken three days or a year, you know? And so the, you're, you're getting more bang for your buck then in spiritual growth terms when, you, when you're allocating a certain amount of your time like that. That's why the enemy to spiritual growth is busyness because if you're trying to manipulate the time continue all the time just to get things done, you, you, you can actually suffer in the integration time that you have as far as your eternal well-being is concerned. So you've got to balance the requirements of the growth and integration of the form existence and the, the aspect of your witch's journey through eternity. Not really something that the head's going to particularly understand. But if you get a sense of it, you know, you find yourself uh, starting to play, play with that.
And that moment when you're looking into that new lover's eyes and they're having this familiarity and connection and melding, you know, really, it might seem like you you were looking into that person's eyes for a year and it might have been two seconds. How much could you actually have accomplished, you know, in real terms as far as activity is concerned in that space? Yet, you know, it's amazing amount of way, you've fitted way more transition of consciousness into that experience than you should have been able to put into a moment. Or conversely, you can fit way more activity into the moment, but with that you're going to narrow the amount, the passage of consciousness. So they're inversely proportional as you, as you, as you play with that. That's why people that get an enormous amount done on the ground on a daily basis, successful business people and that often their spiritual growth, their eternal well-being languishes because they're running hard with playing with time in one way. That's one of the real important balances in your life that you've got to get straightened out. That's why a lot of really successful business people, you know, do things like uh, um, Tai Chi and that sort of thing. So in a really short period of time, they can fit in the need that, to create the space for integration, for their consciousness to float free and dance. But it takes a fairly short period of time to be able to do that. So they can balance that with the rest of their life, the rest of their day, where they're just fitting an enormous amount of activity into particular moments. But there's a very, very narrow focus of, of consciousness. So there's not much space for integration. So they create something else in their life which allows them to have this huge expansive yeah. yeah, these are all important balances to get to get straight in your life. And it's and it's kind of advanced time mastery, but it's becoming more and more and more common with dissemination of yogic techniques in the West. Most people don't understand what they're doing, but it's important to get that really under conscious control. So you you're deciding, you know, and even though you could fit more time in, you have to put a certain amount of time into just being with yourself and allowing the consciousness to float way beyond the confines of the body and out beyond the ring past knot of the planet and so forth. You need a certain amount of time to be able to do that, to be able to integrate and dance and, and relate with the universal energies and so forth. But it's not like half and half. But you, you need to make sure that you're doing, giving that justice. And at certain times, when you go through a lot of integration, you're going to need more time to do that, the integration time, the connecting with the universal consciousness and so on, than at other times. It's not like you just have a routine that you stick with in a regimented way all the time. Yeah? So I'm sorry if there was any confusion there. That makes sense. It's tricky stuff to express in words. As soon as you start to clothe any language, you know, to some degree you've you've lost the essence of what it's really all about. Experiences right lose. Yeah. Happened, lose yourself. I'd lose myself. Mm -hmm. And the more you do that, the more ineffectual you'll become on, as far as a human being living your life, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's a, you've got to get the balance right. I found it really hard to get things done yeah. on time. Yeah. When I draw up a list and get going, I always seem to never fit in. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, there's a balance there that you need to achieve, you know. It's all great to go out and, you know, and experience, get out of yourself and, you know, relate with nature and lose yourself and all of that sort of stuff. That's an important part of what you're doing, but not at the expense of, you know, living a functional life because the context within which you express your mastery and do the spiritualizing of matter is within the context of how you live your, your life. So it's important to balance that with lots of activity squeezed into lots of moments with that intense, focused Concent, you know, concentrated point of living light. That's why I say I'm a concentrated point of living light. Um, but that has to then be balanced with the experience of 
timelessness and formlessness that you're speaking of. But it can be addictive. It's very seductive, particularly if you have a lot of pooey stuff that you don't, that you have difficulty dealing with. Yeah, you know, on yeah, you know, as far as your human expression is concerned. But the the problem is, the more you you deal with the, the formless stuff, uh, the more the easier it is when you come back to the human expression. Instead of honouring the human expression, you find yourself judging it and feeling it's less than and it's yucky and it's, <laughs> you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're not actually doing the job of spiritualising your life and integrating that and then returning that knowing to the formlessness. So you're actually not, the cycle of life between the spiritual and the material isn't working properly, you know, so you're not, you don't have that happening. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I say, this is very spatial, it's very hard to express in words. So all I can do is convey a sense of it and you need to go, oh yeah, I get that, yeah. I've got to balance that and that. I don't know what the hell that is and I can't make notes about it, but yeah, I need to balance that feeling with that feeling. That attitude with that attitude. And, in actual fact, I probably need more of that and Less of that probably is enough, and so it's very intangible points of tension, the narcissus points, you know, within you, uh, which are really important to be able to do justice to the form life and the formless thing as well. The formless thing comes very easily to me as well, and to uh, spatialize. For years, I had to almost hold myself. I used to say. It was like if I just relaxed, it was though like I felt like I was getting sucked out through a straw and I was just out. And it's like, oh, the universe and one with all of that. But, you know, then I realised that, you know, it's about bringing that here. So it's about regularly staying in communion with that and sometimes actually aspecting out into that, but then bringing that here because this is where the problems are. It's about bringing spirit here. It's about spiritualizing this. And you do that through the intense application of your activity. So that's such an important part of the work of spiritualizing matter and bringing about lasting change. Most people will be doing much, far too much of that and not enough, to, not enough of accomplishing things on the ground. It's a fairly safe bet. <laughs> yeah. Not all, but you know, you'll find most will that would be attracted to you, because you know you're so often drawn to teach what you most needed to learn and what you've recently learned. You know. Ah, <sighs> hope that's helpful, and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow.